Man, I'm excited. Um, super excited about, um, about what I believe God will do today in our time together. I have a high expectation that God's going to do something in such a way where it's just impossible to deny the fact that God was here. I believe that. I believe that God meets you at the level of your expectation. And so I just aim high and believe that where God shows up, anything can happen. Amen? And so I need you to know today I'm going to preach myself empty um, because I believe in this. This is not regurgitated information. As we open God's word with his people and his presence, I believe that miracles happen. I believe that darkness must turn to light. I believe that loss turns to found. I believe that anxiety turns into peace because God's there. And that's the really cool thing because in this life there are a million opinions. And so it's for me, it's it's comforting to know that when God shows up to a place, He has the final say so. Amen? So that's my expectation. Nothing less is that God will be here and He will be undeniable. And whether you're close to Him or far from Him, you'll know that He was here and anything was possible because He was here. And so I'm going to preach that way with that level of expectation because I believe when God's word is open, he changes us and we end up changing the world because he changes us. And I could not be more excited and more honored to stand in this pulpit and preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been studying the pilgrimage of God's people from where they were 431 years in slavery in Egypt all the way to promised land. And it's been a pilgrimage that is a journey that is not only their journey, but it is our journey because all of us have promised potential. When God built you, he had intent. He had goals. He had a place of arrival. He had a destination. And so all of us, no matter where we stand or where we sit in auditoriums or where we, where we are in life or in job or in education, all of us are on a similar journey And the beauty of the Bible is it includes all of the truck stops and gas stations. It doesn't just give you the destination. I showed up at Hollywood. It lets you know about the flat tires. It's not a a highlight reel. It's a real deal. Amen. And so I'm thankful. I'm not going to try to preach before we get to God's word. Um, But I did watch the movie about Apostle Paul last night. So your boy is extra excited to teach God's word when you figure out what all the early church had to do to deliver such a gospel. It just makes you thankful for the word of God. Amen. So let's, let's dive into an historical account of a pilgrimage of nearly 2 million slaves. Exodus chapter 14. Moses begins talking to these people. Here's what Moses says as they enter into a new season. They have the Egyptians, Pharaoh, all that represents tyranny and evil on their backside pressing down on them. And in front of them, they have a sea. And here's what Moses says about the potential. Moses says to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and watch. Everybody say stand Stand. and watch. One more time, stand Stand. and watch. watch. Moses was speaking to their circumstance. As slaves, you could never write your own way. You could never perform your own miracle. You had no ownership. So Moses spoke to their circumstance and told them, well, God will take care of this for you, which I understand. They'd been in slavery for nearly 10 generations. So stand and watch. God do his work. Everybody say, do work. work. So just, just stand. You just stand back. And another person tells them actually to shut up and watch. I kind of like that version personally. Stand firm and watch God do his work of salvation for you today. So this is the message from the pastor, the preacher, the planter of the day. But then God intersects without permission and speaks his own word, which is nearly opposite of standing and watching. Here's what God said. God said to Moses, why cry out to me? Speak to the Israelites. That's what pastors are supposed to do, is say what God said, not our opinion or our tradition, but rather what God says. Amen. 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 Order them, and here's what he says. He didn't say stand and watch. He says, get moving. Everybody say, get moving. moving. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, hey, get to moving. Get, get, Get to moving. Get to moving. They're like, I don't want to move, and then just look back at them and say, well, move anyway. Move. Move anyway. So, so, so God says, get moving. Moses says, well, stand and watch. Moses says, hey, chill, watch. God says, move. Contradiction. 
Hold your staff high, Moses, and stretch your hand out over the sea. He continues on, and now we find the calling. We had the circumstance. We had the calling of God, and now we have the promise of God. It says, split the sea. I love this. The Israelites will walk through the sea on dry ground. So, like, if you move, like, I have some stuff for you. That seed that you see will split, and you will walk through it. For me, this is a dilemma. Because in the Bible, you have 7,000 recorded promises of God. Here is another one. That we can be standing in front of impossibilities, and God is able to say, move, and the impossible will be possible. Now, that's really cool for us. Because we're sitting on the other side of the miracle. We know that the moment they stepped into the sea, it was dry ground. But how many of you guys know if we were actually standing in front of, you know, the Gulf of Mexico, and I was like, hey, guys, I don't know how to tell you this, Moses stuttered. But we're supposed to walk through this Gulf Yard saying, hey, I'm going to go find another church. But this is not just the dilemma for God's first kids. This is our dilemma. I think we live most of our life in the middle. I, I, I understand the promise of freedom that God has for me, but I'm standing in the presence of my enemies. I understand that God promises a peace that goes beyond my ability to understand, but I stand in the seat of Monday mornings and all the anxiety that they bring. Oh, come on, can we be real? Yeah. I understand that God says he has promises for my finances. In the context of finance, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I don't know if I'm going to make the mortgage. It's a dilemma when God points to the promise, but you stand in something that's different than the promise. This is the journey of the Israelites. And I think if we're honest, it's our journey. God has this, this promised land For each of us, this promise of freedom, of love and joy and peace and patience. But we live on earth (laughs) and we live next to him and her and I'm dating her and she's dating me and we have jobs, but the jobs don't pay like they ought to pay. So I know that you are a God of abundance, but I got too much month for the money. So I dove into this a little bit further, understanding that my job as a, as a shepherd, as a pastor, is to lead people to everything that God has in them. I had to look further. I had to, as Pastor Neil said last week, by the way, wonderful, wonderful message. Can we give it up for Pastor Neil? It's a wonderful message last week. I honor you. As I looked further in the journey, I found that there was actually a pattern. You don't read scripture to copy and paste it. Because if you copy somebody else's principle and paste it to your situation, it won't match up. Look for principles, you look for patterns. Because I can copy and paste a pattern to my context. So I looked a little deeper in Exodus chapter 14. As Moses was leading a very normal people to a very abnormal place that God had for them. And I want to dive back into this so we can together discover a pattern that we can move towards. Everybody say move. Move. I want you to check out one of the movements that Moses led them through. Go back to verse 16. It says, the Israelites will walk through the sea. Struck me as odd. Is not the God who promised you that he would rescue you in Exodus chapter 6, is he not capable of taking you around the sea? I mean, could he not, David, blame you above the sea? Does he have to take me through the sea? Could he not provide a second route? Could he not create a, you know, pre-first century airplane that has Jesus and the smoke out of the back of the plane says, Holy Spirit, follow me? Like, could God have not offered another way. There has to be intent because I figured out something about God. I've only been following for 15 or 16 years, but what I have followed, found out about God is he never leads you through something without purpose. Yes. In fact, oftentimes the revelation or like the understanding 
of what you went through never makes sense until there's some time applied to it. It's interesting to me that, that God have then moved through the water. So if you're taking notes, I want to write, I want you to write this down because we're going to unpack this. Move through water. This is a pattern in Scripture. Most times in Scripture, the big occurrences, the new seasons, the new births that God would bring his people towards, they, they all had to move through the water. Interesting. He didn't move them around. He moved through the water. In the book of Genesis, the very beginning of Scripture, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord hovered above the face of the deep. It hovered above the deep, and from the waters he brought forth land. Even the earth that was created came through the water. The priest in the Old Testament before Jesus provided me and you access to the holy holies or the presence of God, the priest who represented us, the Levite, would have to go through and around the laver where the water was to get to the holy holies. God understood for you to get to where I have, you have to go through. There's something about the water. You have to go through the water. You don't go around the water. You don't get sprinkled by the water. You go through the water. I find that the family of Noah that was declared righteous by God, a family that he thought was so awesome, so good, that he would restart the population of earth through the family of Noah, even they had to go through the water. Jesus Christ himself, perfect, fully human, fully God. Before he began season of ministry, before he stepped into what was next that God had for them, even Jesus said, bid for me not to come. I, I have to go through the water. Apostle Paul, the greatest writer of all time, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. A guy named Ananias in Acts chapter 9 had to baptize him before ministry. Yeah. Why? To go th through the water. Ladies, you know this. Men, we have no clue, but every birth leading up to the birth, months and weeks and the days before the baby comes out, the water must break because God always births newness through the water. It's interesting to me because Apostle Paul, 1,500 years later, follow me, I'm taking you somewhere. Apostle Paul, 1,500 years later, recounts the historical event of the God's first kids, the Israelites, going through the Red Sea. Now, if we are the Israelites, we're thinking, there's the enemy, there's the sea. Why in the world would I ever go through water? It makes no sense. Sometimes revelation comes in retrospect. Sometimes when you look in the rearview mirror, you thank God for what you used to complain about. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Come on, they broke up with you 25 years ago and you were a wreck for a week. But now when you look on Facebook, you thank God they let you go. Come on, somebody. Come on, you got fired or demoted 15 years ago, but now you own a company that's bigger than the one who let you go. Because <laughs> God never takes you through something without purpose. We found out the first two weeks that Miracles follow motion. Stand and watch Christianity. We'll have you on the outskirts of the miraculous. And you will be frustrated at Christianity. Because yes. you will have the expectation you see of the Bible, but you're living something very different. Yes. That's why I grew up in church, but hated it. I somehow grew up in church and I didn't know God. I was frustrated because I'd sing about him. I'd give my tithe to him, but I did not experience the power of who he really was practically. It's frustrating. Without movement, it's frustrating to be stuck because stand and watch turns into being stuck. Let's recount what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, as he recounts the exodus of God's people. Corinthians 10 says this. It says, they went through the waters in a baptism like ours as Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. Interesting. What the people of Israelites called a miracle of audacious faith, of a stepping from something I don't know through the water to dry land, Paul provides clarity to such an event. He calls it baptism. Because 
You have to go through the water in order to get to the new season. You say, J.D., what do you mean? Well, let's dive in just for a minute. I'm going to take you somewhere. The Israelites had been slaves for 431 years. Generation after generation struggling with the same tyranny. Generation after generation struggling with the same doubt and the same fear and the same horrendous evil leader. We say, J.D., but, but Moses said that they would be free. And God said in Exodus chapter 6, his promise was, I will set you free. So the reality was, from a spiritual sense, the moment that God says it, that settles it. The reality was when he said, I'll set you free because he is a God of the beginning, middle, and end at the same time. They were spiritually free. The problem is, just like the Israelites, you can be saved spiritually, but still a slave. Yes. You can know the promise of God says, I'm supposed to be free of that addiction. But how many of you guys know just because I said yes to Jesus doesn't mean that my addiction walks out the door. Doesn't mean that my fear walks out the door. And I begin thinking about the Israelites. Why in the world would God ever have them go through the water? Makes no sense to me. Robes all dirty and muddy. Smell like nasty fish, like Jonah showing up at the wrong place. It's nasty. Until I begin to realize when Moses provided clarity that it was a baptism, you say, what do you mean? If the Israelites would have ran away with the spiritual understanding of freedom, they would have been spiritually free but mentally afraid. Because as long as Pharaoh and his armies were alive, they would just be runaway slaves. I'm running and I think he says I'm free but they're still pressing. I'm running, and God says I'm free, so I'm going to sing about it. I'm going to show up and preach about it, but he's still alive. The chariots are still rolling. The horses are still snorting because they're still an enemy. I'm in the promise of God, but the presence of my enemy, and I'm stuck. So why did he call it a baptism? Because in baptism, you have death, burial, and resurrection. You didn't catch it. There's death, burial, and resurrection. You say, what do you mean by that? God understood in order for them to be free, it was not just spiritual freedom. Because you're not just spiritual beings. And this is the problem where we get stuck because we understand spiritual salvation, but we don't know how to get free of our mind. We've been slaves for 45 years. My marriage has been in trouble for 22 years. Just because I raised my hand doesn't mean our marriage is free. So what happened? God said, if you'll go through the Red Sea, it will be a baptism for you. It will be death, burial, and resurrection. I came to tell some people this morning that baptism, when you go through the water, it's just like the Israelites. You say, what do you mean? The Israelites follow you down into the water, but on the other side of the water, your enemy had a place of burial, and it has to die. The Israelites went through the water, and what had led them around for 431 years was drowned in the sea. Moving did not make sense until you were on the other side of movement. You can't have freedom without movement. This is why he had to interrupt Moses. Because Moses do, does what I would do. I'd be like, hey guys, I don't really know what we're doing. Let's just stand and watch God. So we've created churches and churches of denomination where you stand and watch and then you're frustrated because nothing changes. And you know what Moses is saying? Moses was recounting and saying, you know what? God told them to move. And when they moved through the Red Sea, some things died and some things lived. They moved through the water because baptism is the touch point for freedom. It's the burial place. I am spiritually free, but I needed something physical to remind me that fear no longer leads me. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to addiction. I'm no longer a slave to anxiety. God set me free. Come on, somebody. Miracles follow motion. Emotion won't do it. I wish it could work. I wish we could all cry and wake up and be delivered. Some of us have been taught that it was about a dip, but God saw deliverance. Some of us taught that it was about tradition, but it was transformation. 
And so I had the expectation of tradition and that's exactly what I got. But if I would have had the expectation of transformation, I would have looked at baptism different. Paul calls it baptism because it was a place where sin died. It was a reminder that when I look at this place, I know I'm not supposed to turn my back on a camera, but I'm doing something. (laughs) The place of baptism was a place where my faith grew. Not a tradition, not a moment that I did because I was second Baptist and I had to to go attend Sunday school class three times and check the card. Y'all remember that? Y'all didn't grow up Baptist like me. The baptism was not a part of filling out a card. It was a miraculous moment where you realize when I stood up, I am reminded of the things that no longer lead me. Christ lives in me. The power, the risen Christ lives. I don't have to be led around by fear. Move through the water. That's why sprinkling doesn't work. That's why I didn't say move around the water or get squirted by something. All of that is good. Different is not in fear. I'm just saying the Bible says move through the water. Yes. Let me ask you a question. Did tradition live a perfect life for you and die up on a cross and get beat down and murdered and rise again? Then why worship it? I'm not held to my tradition as much as I am held to the hands that were scarred, to the body that was broken for my iniquities. It is Christ who lives in me. The water is not just something you check. It's a reminder that I'm I'm really free. (laughs) He moved them through the water. If if today had a, a title, it would be, God wants to move you through so he can move you to, so he can move you on in. Come on, somebody, say move through. through. To move to. to. That's hard to say. Just say move to. to. So you can move in. God has a place for you. This is not just fancy rhetoric. I say it like that so you can actually remember it. I'm not trying to be fancy. God has a place for you. And he always moves you through water first. And then he moves you to another place. Exodus chapter 15 is the very next stop once they move through worship. And I want you to see what exactly happens after you move through water because according to scripture, they moved to worship. Let's go to Exodus chapter 15. Here's what Moses says. He said, the Lord is my strength and my defense. So I came out of the water and all of my enemies' mouths were shut. They were dethroned because God has finished the work. When he said it is finished, that was past, present, and future. So all the haters just lost their voice in my life. And my defense, he has become my salvation. Not a pastor, not JD, not the bishop, not the illustrious one with the robe. Jesus became my salvation. He is my God. Now watch the response. His only response. I move through the water and I move to praise. He says, and I, I will, not I oughta, not I may, not I'm thinking about it, not I'm pondering, not I'm pontificating. I will praise him. It's not even an option for me. I command my body to praise the Lord. I don't feel like it move anyway. Now, this is where it gets a little tense in the room. If you're watching online, it just got really tense, really quiet. It gets quiet because this word praise ensues a certain amount of division. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's hard to pastor a church or lead a church towards biblical praise. It's just tough. Can I be vulnerable? Oh, I can't? Can I be vulnerable? Somebody's like, no, I kind of wish you'd just stay like that. (laughs) That hit me really funny. (laughs) It's it's hard to pastor all of the people and all the, the services and the people watch. It's hard to pastor on the subject of praise. You say, why, why, why? That should be easy. Just read the Bible and teach it. The problem with the English word praise is the moment that I say praise, if I were to say one, two, three, praise, everybody would be running a different play because I define praise based on the lens that I learned it. 
So if I showed up in a particular domination, praise may look like page, page 301 on that red back. Can I get an amen, somebody? You don't know nothing about a red back book. Right in front of you, boy, it was easy. Page, I know what page 301 is right now. If you say praise to me, that, that would be it. Grab the, where's, the, where's the red book? It's a horrible church, no red books. For somebody else, the moment I say one, two, three, praise, it would be, hey, where's the communion? We were taught that that was praise, right? For somebody else, the moment that we say praise, you begin to look for where, where's the people with the dresses, like robes, whatever. Like, where's those people swaying? Like, that, 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 that's praise. We have our own ingredients, our own definition, our own assumption, our own preference for this, for this word pray. It's hard to pastor people with preference. Because the reality is, <laughs> I tell people all the time, just like Pastor Chris says, uh, he says that the church is like the Baskin Robbins. We've got 31 flavors. And it's cool, but it's just hard because you walked in with your normal version of praise, and I get it. And so it's, it's hard to take us to where God has us because we all have different definitions of praise. Different Moses is, said it again, said it in first service. Moses is, brilliant, I'm a great communicator. <laughs> have different versions. In fact, we actually got some photographers together and we're trying to get like pictures of you guys just so you know how you look during worship, Okay. Yeah, yeah, you may have seen photographers. They were taking pictures of you during worship because I just had to prove to you that everybody has a different version or different way to praise. In fact, here's one of the pictures we found of some of you guys. Here's what it looked like. <laughs> That's awesome. If we actually found some, that's for you guys. That's kind of what some of you look like. You have that pocket praise going on, killing that pocket, wearing that thing out, just pocket praise. Just pocket praise that thing. Every once in a while, I get a little hip, whoop, pocket praise, whoop, pocket praise. Oh, if an I can only imagine comes on, and we go from pocket to, whoop, right there, hello. Great song. Then we actually found some pictures. Some of y'all don't realize it's okay to have fun in church. You're like, ha. Ah. You thought the more it hurts, the better church was. <laughs> we actually found some pictures. Uh, the photographers took pictures, not just of you guys, but some people on the platform, some of the worship leaders, and they actually took this one. Here's, here's what this one said. Um, <laughs> you got to have a little swoop to be a worship leader, I guess. You got to cover that eye. That's where the anointing is. It's hard to praise. It's hard to lead people. When there's, everybody has a different version. Why watch this. How many people grew up Baptist? No, don't raise it that high. We're Baptist. Stop. Okay. How many people grew up Presbyterian? Woo! You're waiting on communion. I get it. What about um, any, any Catholics? What? Any, yeah, there we go. Love that. Um, what about Methodists? Come on, somebody. Um, what about non-denominational? You were too cool for school. Yeah, yeah. Let everybody know that we are not a denomination. So we're going to call ourselves non-denominational. Um, what, what about charismatics? Yeah, we knew you were going to yell. We, we knew was. Do you see my dilemma, though? How do we lead such a diverse definition of praise? Because men always have their own expression or interpretation of the word praise. So what I did is I went to the Bible because my opinion on worship doesn't really matter. What matters is what God says about praise because praise is for God. In fact, the Bible commands me, Jesus taught me to pray on earth as it is in, come on, on earth. as it is in, earth. one more time, on earth. as it is in, earth. now louder, on earth. as it is in, earth. that's our job to bring on earth. as it is in, earth. my job is to bring praise as it is on, earth. I just messed the whole thing up. Here's what John the Revelator says. John the Revelator is a guy who is able to see the end. God showed him the end in heaven once we all get there. I want you to see what praise looks like when we all get to the place where God is in control, fully control. Here's what it says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It says, after this, I looked, and therefore we saw a great multitude that no one can count. From every nation, every tribe, people, and language, all different types of people. 
He continues on with what he sees. He says, standing before the throne and before the lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches. Why do I have palm branches bold right there? Because it's palm branch Sunday and I was trying to fit it in somehow. (laughs) Holding palm branches in their hands. He continues on. And they cried out in a loud voice. All different tribes, all different languages, all different shapes and sizes and preferences and definitions, but there was not loud voices. There was a loud. Maybe unity is not your political stance or everybody getting on the same page. Maybe it's maybe unity is the same voice of praise. And it does not stay small, quiet. It actually says that when God finally gets it how he wants it, it is. Why do you think we have, what are these things called that go in your ears? Why do you think we have earplugs on campus? Because I actually don't like super, super loud music all the time. But it's not about my preference. If God's love language for praise is loud, we give it to him how he wants it. Not how our tradition tells us to give it to him. We want to be a church that prays over preference is our style. Praise over preference is our style. My preference is standing and watching because that's what I've been taught. I was under a guy like Moses and our job was to stand and watch the Lord. You know, and then when I can only imagine comes on, the the hand comes up. Because it was about the moment or the song, not about the king. It is... That was strong. (laughs) Oh! We're one of those churches. Oh! We have a little thug happening on the front row. Come one, come all. It's hard for God to take you to potential if you are tied to preference. It's hard for God to take you to what he has for you if you are strapped, tied, and chained to the thing that you've always known. That's why he had to move them from Egypt. Because no matter, you can, even if it's slavery, if you've been there long enough, it is comfortable. Because at least I know what to expect. But God calls me to move through the water and move to worship. Jesus was so angry at times, not sinning, but angry, not at the people who are far from him. He was most angry at the people who allowed tradition to stand in the way of what he had for them. In fact, every time that you find God, Jesus Christ incarnate, raising his voice with a little bit of oomph, it was to the people who were more tied to their preference than his praise. You don't believe me. I'm going to show you some scripture. Matthew chapter 15 says this. Jesus is talking. He says, you nullify. You take all the power out of it. What's a powerful word. You dethrone the word of God for the sake of your tradition. He's saying, Israelites, you would have never experienced miracles if you would have stood and watched at the Red Sea when I said to move. Don't fall in love with the old methods. Fall in love with the Messiah. That's why I had to say, I am who I am. He said, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about people like you. May we never be this type of church. My job is, is to preach the Bible and to take us to where God has called us to go. Because here's what we don't want to look like. He said, you people look like this. These people honor me with their lips. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. It's not even powerful. It's not even, it's not even with all their heart. It's more, it's more about practice and less about power. It's more about preference and less about praise. It's more about comfort and less about the calling that I have for them. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely rules. You know what religion is? Man's attempt at praise. You've always put praise in a box. You have to understand your box is not a good enough gift to God. He doesn't like to be boxed up. They put him in a grave and he didn't stay there. The hard thing about the word praise is it's an English word. The further that you dive into this word praise, you find that there are seven Hebrew words that kind of make up this one word praise. 
So more than any other commandment in Scripture, you have the, the commandment to praise. 175 times in the book of Psalms, you have praise to the Lord. But if you carry your own preference of praise into Scripture, then you will not move forward because you're tied to what the way you've always praised. So let me take you a little further. Y'all still following me? Still heading somewhere? There are seven Hebrew words that make up the word praise. And here's what I, here's what I would say I would love for us as a church to do. What would it be like if we were the type church that kind of honored tradition, honored the ways that have went before us, respected them, which is our calling. But also, when God says moved, we died to preference so that we could live for his mission. Can we be the kind of church that moved when God says move? Come on, somebody. Tradition never saved me. Preference never rescued me. I'm tied to Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow It's about Jesus. It's about his preference. If praise is about giving him what he wants, let's find out what his love language is. Because any other thing is selfish praise, not selfless praise. Amen. Praise. Here's the seven different words. Real quickly, one of them is brought to kneel down. This is more of a private way to praise. Do this at your home. Yada is to worship with extended hands in public. This This is how he wants it. Yada. On the count of three, everybody lift your hands just like this, okay? With extended hands in public. One, two, three, let's do it. Seven seconds, just leave it there, leave it there, leave it there, just leave it there. Whoa, whoa, leave it there, leave it there. You're like me, you're Baptist, so you think you're sitting. It's okay, just leave it up. Okay, now watch. Imagine what it must look like from heaven for God to look down right now and go, oh my gosh, he finally, she finally gave it to me in the way I wanted it. Imagine what it must look like for it finally to look on earth like it does in heaven. Every tribe, every nation, all different preferences, dying to their own preference to give him what he wants. This is praise. Republicans sitting next to Democrat, old sitting next to young, but unified in our praise because God does not give options to praise. He gives his way to praise, and we are unified when we praise him. You can put your hands down. Other ones, Zamar, to play music with loud strings. If you want the JDV, it just means to shred that guitar until God shows up. (laughs) I don't like loud guitar, then you would hate heaven. Another one is Shabbat. This is to sing in a loud voice. He did not ask you if you were good at singing. He demands that we sing with a loud voice. So when we sing in a minute, give it to him the way he wants it. Will it be uncomfortable? Will it be hard? Yeah, but so was the Red Sea. But if you will move through and you will move to worship, you will move in potential. It's on the other side of movement. Here's a a fun one. Tehillah. Exuberant singing. Some of y'all are like, I absolutely know what that means. I've been on Broadway too many times not to know that Tehillah makes me sing loud. Some of y'all just took that scripture right out of context. Psalms 34, 1, his tehillah will always be on my lips. <laughs> tehillah, to sing exuberantly. Don't take that one out of context. Tauda, to lift hands and surrender. We don't lift our hands because it's our preference or our denomination says to. God says to. It's not options, it's his way. Give it to him how he wants it. Hallel, the root word for hallelujah means to rave. (laughs) Some of you would leave church if it turned into a rave. But perhaps your preference would keep you away from the fact he says, I always wanted it that way in the first place. To rave or boast, to be glamorously foolish. To lose my cool. Because when I've moved through the water and I'm able to look back at a touch point and say, I used to be a slave. I used to be entrapped. I used to be in sin. I used to be in doubt. I used to be in shame. But look back at the moment where Pharaoh stopped leading me and God started leading. I stopped following my sin, my nature. I started following what Jesus had. It makes me want to worship. You don't have to beg me to praise because I remember what it was like to be enslaved. The Bible asks me to clap my hands, I get to clapping. The Bible asks me to lift my hands, I'll lift them sweaty pits and all. 
Come on, somebody. Listen, do you want miracles? Do you want God to show up in your family in such a way where you're like, man, I really, I can really see in this, this side of the business that God showed up. It requires movement. You can stand and watch. It's just a different experience. Let's, let's be a church who prays and who's worship. His style, not ours. Do you hear me? I'm calling the people who call Church of the Hills home. Not my preference, not our preference. His. Let's be that type of church where it looks on earth as it is in. We praise on as it is in. We praise on like it is in. We're going to praise on like it is in heaven. Do you catch it? Something will change in you when you move the way God says it. If you don't believe me, try it. There's a promise in James chapter 4, verse 8 that says, Come near to God and he will come near to you. I love that's how Jesus is. He says, when you move, I move. When you move, I move. When you move, I move. Thank you. Front row's helping out a ton. When I was in my room at 19 years old, headed to Vanderbilt, won a major in epidemiology, had my life planned out, and I felt like God wanted to rescue me from my own sin, my own dreams, my own way. It made no sense to step in a different direction. Make no sense. You know what I found out? His promise is true. That when I stepped from what I knew, I stepped into what he knew. When I stepped from my darkness, I stepped into his light. When I stepped from my anxiety, I stepped into his peace. I found out that miracles always have followed motion. But if you're anything like me, the moment that I get ready to raise my hand, I, I, I first, before I move, I look in the mirror and measure myself. Anybody else like that? Like before you ever step into what God has, you first, you begin measuring yourself up. I don't know if I'm comfortable. I don't know if I'm gonna do this. Is he or she gonna do this? I've never done this before. Do I really mean it? Is it actually accurate? Or am I just, is this emotion? Anybody else like that? Anybody else schizophrenic when it comes to worship? <laughs> There's a verse in Hebrews chapter four that will set you free. If you have the audacity to move, he has the audacity to show up where you are and perform miracles. They're not just Bible. They are for you. They are for your family. They are for your teenagers. They are for your kids. They are for your finances. They are for your mind. They are for your mouth. They are for your home. They are for your cousins, brothers, sisters, uncle, brothers, sisters, wives, and pets. They're for everybody. Did I just say pets? (laughs) Hebrews chapter four says this. Let us then approach God's throne. Before I measure up, before I measure up, before I don't measure up, how should we approach God's throne? What's the God's throne of grace, which means he paid the toll for me to get there. And so my approach is to be with confidence. I've never felt good enough to step onto this platform and share this gospel. Never, never, not once. But I approach with confidence and boldness because of the grace of God. Some of you today, you took a dip 30 years ago for tradition's sake. And your experience was a tradition. I'm inviting you, just like the people of the Israelites, to say bye-bye to your enemy, bye-bye to fear, bye-bye to Pharaoh, to move through the water again. I did it this summer at the Jordan River in Israel. I feel like God was calling me to a new season of ministry, a new season of passion, and my behind went to the Jordan River and got baptized. Why? Because I knew in order to go to a new season, he had to move me through the water. Miracles follow motion. All of Christianity can be boiled down to God's grace, my movement. Paul said we move from glory to glory, good to good. God's pathway for you is the same as the Israelites. He wants to get you from here to there. And when I move, he moves. And when I move, he moves. And when I move again, he moves. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You move, he'll move. That's why we meet you in the water. That's why we move you to worship. So here's what we're going to do. I'm asking everybody into the sound of my voice, everybody here, everybody watching, to move some way this morning. Because miracles follow motion. God has a plan for you. Hear me? A plan for you. Some of you need to move through the water because you've made a decision for Christ, but you need a burial place. You need a place to look back and say, it's finished. It's over. That sin, that addiction, That arrogance, that selfish pride, that tradition, it's over. I'm moving towards Christ. That's what baptism is. Well, it's only for the sinful. Then why did Jesus get baptized? It's a place of burial. 
And then while they're getting baptized, I want to move our church towards biblical worship. What does that mean? I'm not going to ask you to praise based on preference. I'm going to ask you to praise based on Bible, His preference. When we sing Shabbat, what does it mean? It means sing loudly. If you're all key, off key, it just makes for comedy. So there it is. <laughs> what do you expect me to do? We're just going to go all out. Amen? Would you do me a favor? Before we get ready to move, we want people to make some decisions for Christ. And then the journey of Christianity is just moving. So we're going to take that journey together. But everybody bow your head, close your eyes. If you would like to give Jesus your life, if you would say, you know what? I am stuck and I need Jesus to rescue me. I'm thankful for his life, his death and resurrection because it can lead me. If that's you on the count of three, just raise your hand. And you say, you know what? I'm beginning a relationship with Jesus today. He promises to rescue me. Well, I need rescuing. I'm not talking about tradition. I'm not talking about membership. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying Jesus came to rescue you. Don't believe me. Try it. On the count of three, if that's you, just wave at me. Say, hey, you know what? That's me. I want Jesus to save my life today, to save me from my sin and lead me to my potential. If that's you on the count of three, just raise your hand. One, two, three. Wave at me. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Jesus, would you save me? Would you lead me towards everything that you have? Today I repent. I go the other way. I move away from my sin and I move towards you. Ask your spirit and the church, the family of God to lead me in the way that's everlasting. I repent and I follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, can we put our hands together for the many people that made decisions for Christ? Oh, come on. You can do better than that.